a completely bogus trial with bribes, false witnesses, and shady religious rulers and political snakes overseeing the whole ordeal. Add to it mockers mocking, scoffers scoffing, blasphemers blaspheming, sneering and jeering from heckling haters, and you have the general context of Luke 23. This is one of many chapters in Scripture which highlight the crucifixion of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to join me this evening in the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. According to John's Gospel, the Lord Jesus came to his own, and those who were his own, by and large, received him not. They eventually cry out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Give us Barabbas. From the old rugged cross, Jesus proclaims seven remarkable sayings. These seven sayings, quoting A.W. Pink, reveal the excellencies of the one who suffered there and inform us of the purpose the meaning, and the sufficiency of the death divine. We will better appreciate the eternal and personal significance of Good Friday if we prayerfully consider these holy utterances. After considering Jesus' first cross saying back in 2019, When Jesus said in Luke 23, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We move on to verses 39 to 43, which highlights the second cross saying of Jesus. Tonight's text vividly contrasts Two criminals, two attitudes, and two very different responses to the Savior King's cross. And to help us understand this passage, I've broken it down into four headings. First, we will look at the hardened criminal's jeer, followed by the softened convert's rebuke. We'll then hear the desperate sinner's plea, and finally, listen in to the dear Savior's promise. Let's uh, pick up Luke's narrative as we get God's perspective on the cross, and we'll pick up the gospel of Luke in the 23rd chapter Verse 39, here we find, firstly, the hardened criminal's jeer. The hardened criminal's jeer. Verse 39, and one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at Jesus, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself, and us. By the time you get to verse 39, these human scarecrows are now affixed to Roman crosses. Roman crucifixion was simultaneously torturous and humiliating, and at the same time was intended to evoke fear. Cross Caesar, and you'll be next. The Prince of Glory, the High King of Heaven, is providentially placed between two low-life thieves, the Rose of Sharon 
among thorns. The Gentile soldiers and Jewish rulers have already ridiculed Jesus. They have already spoken their peace at the Prince of Peace. One of the condemned criminals joins his voice and begins to rub salt into Jesus' open wounds. He has already been beaten, a crown of thorns upon his head, scourged, whipped nearly to death, and now this criminal adds insult to injury. One of the criminals who was hanging there next to Jesus, was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. There are times when we ought to feel totally ashamed. There are times we ought to feel totally ashamed to belong to the human race. This is mankind at its worst. Here is an unrighteous sinner indicting the righteous branch of David. At Calvary, guilty sinners poke fun and mock the unblemished Lamb of God. The one falsely accused of blasphemy, Jesus, you who are a man made yourself out to be equal with God, calling yourself the Son of God. The one falsely accused of blasphemy is himself blasphemed against. Aren't you the Messiah? Aren't you God's chosen one? the Son of God? How can Jesus be the Savior King if he can't even take care of himself? Here is Jesus suffering upon the cross, bearing sin on his sinless shoulders, and people are laughing, mocking. Today, when I'm away from this church and other believers, really the only time I can count on hearing the name of Jesus is when it's being used as a swear word or in conjunction with other swear words. And yet we realize, as we sing in our songs, beloved, as we contemplate Good Friday, as we consider that which we call Good Friday, behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. We're not merely embarrassed as we consider this hardened criminal's jeers, though that is something uh, that is heartbreaking and despicable. And yet, the Word of God is a mirror, and in it we see our own blemishes, which are many. And we realize that the only thing that we who believe contributed to our salvation is the very sin which made it necessary for Jesus to be there in the first place. So we move then from the hardened criminal's jeers and all the surrounding circumstances and individuals and 
It gives way to, secondly, the softened convert's rebuke. The softened convert's rebuke. And one of the criminals who was hanging there was hurling abuse at Jesus, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. At some point, we don't know exactly when, the Holy Spirit blew. A stony heart was made new. Blind eyes were granted 2020 vision. It it, it comes to us as, as unexpected as the most shocking strike of lightning on a, a clear day. With unexpected suddenness, a vile sinner is gloriously born again. And so, even if you listen carefully, you hear the refrain of heaven, salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb who hangs upon the cross. The Savior saving sinners while suffering from Calvary's tree. And you say, wait a minute, preacher, you you seem to be assuming quite a bit. Perhaps you are are reading uh, too optimistically into the sacred text, uh, trying to soften uh, the, the shame and the darkness that surrounds the cross spiritually and even physically. Just hang with me and you'll witness from Calvary, a miracle of miracles. Now, the greatest miracle of all miracles, the miracle of salvation. Previously, this man, who I'm referring to as the softened convert, had joined his voice with the chorus of blasphemy raised against the Holy One of Israel. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verse 41, gives us a parallel account of the cross. And it said this, Matthew writes this, Matthew 27, 41, in the same way the chief priests of Israel also, along with the scribes and elders, the most religious people, were mocking Jesus. Verse 44, Matthew 27, and the robbers, plural. The two thieves who surrounded Jesus, also who had been crucified with him, were casting the same insult at him. Seemingly out of nowhere, this unnamed lawbreaker reprimands his jeering partner in crime. Notice the sharp contrast that is painted here between the two criminals. We see in verse 38, now there was also an inscription above Jesus' cross. This is the king of the Jews. Again, uh, that is an ironic inscription for those who did not believe it are the ones who affix it over the Savior's cross. And yet, we know because God has granted us by his grace eyes to see that Jesus truly is the King of the Jews. He is the Savior of the world. And the text says uh, one of those uh, hardened criminals uh, was continuing to uh, hurl abuse. Uh, Take his uh, parting shots at Jesus. 
making fun of him, saying, uh, clearly you're not who you, you and, and, and just a few remaining disciples holding on to hope that, that you are the long-awaited Messiah. Save yourself and us. But by the grace of God, the other began to rebuke his partner in crime. He said to him, do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, you would think that a death row inmate in his remaining hour, if ever there was a time to do some uh, serious soul-searching, uh, this would be that time. And surely there have been, in the history of death row inmates, those uh, who suffered the due penalty for their crimes, their sins, their crimes against humanity, all crimes against humanity, if they are true crimes against humanity, are first and foremost sins against our Creator God. There have been some who have, uh, by the grace of God, come to their senses, but we know that, sadly, so many remain hardened in their hardened consciences, and one of them went out this way. But the other began to rebuke him. The other uh, began to, uh, to understand. Uh, he saw himself for, for who he truly uh, was, and he began to see Jesus with blessed simplicity, yet gospel clarity that this Jesus actually uh, is the Son of God, that this Jesus actually is the, the Savior of the world, that this Jesus truly is the long-awaited Messiah, the King of Israel. And he understands that all men created in the image of God will one day, regardless of when they die and how they die, that, that when we come to the end, that that means that we will soon be standing before God in the courtroom of heaven. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 9.27 that it is appointed for man to die once. We will all die, and after this comes judgment. And so here he is saying, I retract my previous blasphemies. Uh, he is regretting his life of sin. He is saying, I'm getting, and we're getting what we deserve, but not so with this Jesus. Can't you see that this man is completely innocent? And what he says, uh, in stark contrast to the hardened criminal, uh, what he says about Jesus is actually what Pontius Pilate himself came to understand in his off-the-record verdict uh, recorded earlier in Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 3, Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, it is as you say. And Pilate said to the chief priests and the multitudes, I find no guilt in this man. He eventually went along with their wishes because uh, he feared uh, his own, he cared more about his own human reputation and in his own career uh, more than he did actual justice. And so he sentenced an innocent man to die, giving in to the bloodlust of those self-righteous Pharisees, those who belonged to the Sanhedrin. A pilot had reflected the undisputed position of heaven, that Jesus was sinless, holy, undefiled, that this was the holy, holy, holy Lamb of God. This one who is holy, holy, holy is worthy, worthy, worthy uh, to receive the praises of the angels and the adoration of all who have been redeemed by his blood. Against utter darkness, a hell-bent criminal now sees the light. As Dr. Tannehill notes, that Jesus' death is not a refutation of messianic claims, but it is a prelude to messianic power. 
His eyes had been opened to see the king in all of his beauty. That here in his his death and his shame, the son of man is being lifted up. And God is glorifying himself in the salvation of sinners of which this man places himself among the worst of sinners. He understands that the bloody cross gives way to the radiant crown. The suffering proceeds to glory. The humiliation happens before the exaltation. The softened convert's rebuke gives way thirdly to the desperate sinner's plea. This is what must be said by all of us uh, who have sinned against this Christ and this God, if we are to experience the blessings of forgiveness and the joy of heaven. This is a desperate sinner crying out to Christ, asking him if there's a place in his holy and sinless heart to accept him to receive him, to welcome him, to grant him grace, to extend to him mercy and forgiveness. Verses 40 through 42 reflect the broken heart of a truly penitent sinner. This is the heart attitude of all who come here today before the Lord's table on this Good Friday. We acknowledge what this man is about to say, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless lamb of God is he. A friend recently who had fallen into sin, a believer He asked me uh, what passages of Scripture I would turn to uh, that best reflect uh, the doctrine of repentance, true repentance. Or perhaps uh, if, if I would point him to uh, the most clear, uh, the most concise, the most powerful example of true repentance. Beloved, this is, this is the context. This is the individual who came to mind. The words that have been preserved for us here in Scripture manifest all the marks of authentic repentance. I would encourage you to take time this weekend and compare Luke 23, verses 40 to 42 with Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, those are inspired songs of genuine repentance. They reflect the heart cry of one who has been truly broken over their sin. There is a difference, friends, between true repentance and worldly sorrow. Uh, There are many contrasts Uh, that are painted in the scene of the cross and the characters around the cross between the two thieves, but also even that between Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, who sold out the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. But there was also another disciple, a true disciple, not a false disciple, a false convert like Judas named Simon Peter, who also in the hour of his Lord's greatest need, as you know, uh, he denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. Peter repented. Uh, Peter was reconciled to God in Christ, we know in John 21. Judas Iscariot felt bad over what he had done, but but he was never truly repentant. He hung himself and catapulted himself into hell. 
When you think about the beatings, the scourgings, the crown of thorns, the mocking, the blaspheming of, of, of Christ, some of you uh, see your, 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 as you think about the sinless Son of God and as you contemplate your own sinfulness, uh, there are those who are sorrowful, but there's a worldly sorrow, and then there's genuine repentance. True repentance honestly admits the guilt of sin and humbly accepts the just penalty for one's iniquity. And true repentance humbly cries out to God, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Notice the desperate sinner's plea, verse 42. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Something glorious, something miraculous, something unexpected, something heavenly has taken place. He says, remember me for good, King Jesus. Do not bar me from your glorious kingdom. He has already acknowledged the guilt of sin and the guilt of his own sin. Uh, He has rebuked his scoffing, jeering, criminal friend. His eyes have been opened to the sinfulness of sin. He has admitted that the wages of sin is death, and after death comes judgment apart from the grace of God. But he is here in these words crying out to Christ, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. This desperate sinner's humble plea is reflected in many of the best Christian hymns and praise songs today. And the reason why we we find this sentiment in so many of our songs and in this verse is because it is the common refrain in every believer's testimony. In a moment, When we pass the cup, we will sing that wonderful song, His Mercy is More. And we are going to say, our sins, they are many. More than I can remember, more than I can count. But God knows them all. And yet, because of his great love towards us, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and his Mercy is more. His grace is greater than not one, not many, but all our sin, the sum total, the reason for Jesus' suffering and death upon this shameful, scandalous cross. This man has a desperate plea. He is asking God in Christ, the Son of God, the King of Israel, to manifest mercy to grant him what he does not deserve to to allow him a place in his glorious kingdom from the hymn just as i am to the dying words of the astronomer copernicus who said i do not ask for the grace that you gave saint paul nor do i ask for the grace that you granted saint peter but the mercy which you did show the dying robber that mercy lord show to me lord be merciful to us sinners this is his desperate plea. He is asking for grace and God will be pleased, was pleased to grant it because Jesus suffered, was punished, condemned on behalf of sinners like this man, like this man, like you. The question is, how will Jesus respond? This comes then to our fourth and final and most important heading. 
the desperate sinner's plea is followed up by, is responded to by the dear Savior's promise. This is the second cross saying of Jesus while suffering upon Calvary's tree. And Jesus said to him, Remember, this man, there is no way of escape from death. The question is, is there a way of escape from the just, holy, eternal wrath of God against sinners? Notice the dear Savior's promise, his response to the desperate sinner's plea. Oh, how I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus was saying, he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Verse 43 is a gracious, glorious promise of salvation. I want you to notice quickly three things. We cannot contemplate and consider the Savior's cross without celebrating salvation. Notice, true salvation is divinely assured. Jesus said to the believing criminal, first word, truly. Stop right there. This word truly means most assuredly, I say to you. If you're a Christian, unlike this man, he didn't have a chance to do two things. He didn't have a chance to prove the genuineness of his faith and love. Uh, by performing any sanctifying works of obedience. But he also, because he's going to die in less than an hour, he also didn't have a chance after his conversion uh, to uh, sin against the one who saved him from those sins. Satan often uh, seeks against true Christians uh, to cause us to doubt, to question uh, our salvation. Remember, true salvation is divinely assured because, dear friends, it is all of grace. Truly, truly, I say to you, I promise you, forgiveness is assured to all who truly repent. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice, secondly, true salvation is immediate. Truly, I say to you, today, today, you shall be with me. Notice this penitent sinner requests future grace and instead he receives an immediate promise. And that is exactly what happened to us in the moment, dear believer, in the moment of our salvation. He requests future grace. Instead, he receives an immediate promise pertaining to paradise today. Uh, This uh, guarantee of of, of an immediate reunion in glory is, of course, in some ways unique in the fact that this man is is, is about to die, but but it it points to a present salvation. It also reminds us that that, uh, this guy, again, uh, if anybody, uh, if there was such a place as purgatory where people who, you know, 
were believers, but you know, not the best sort of believers, you know, not the most faithful and devoted of, of, of sorts, would, would go, uh, surely that guy would go there first and have to suffer maybe for a while. But no, he says today, uh, there is no limbo, there is no purgatory, there is no soul sleep. Uh, to be absent from the body for a believer is to be at home immediately with the Lord. Salvation is divinely assured. It is immediate. And finally, I want you to notice this. True salvation is forever. Truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. A paradise. Where's, where's paradise? What's paradise? A paradise is uh, eternal glory. This makes sense, doesn't it? That the eternal son, Jesus, offers eternal life. That word paradise is only used three times in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 12, 4, Revelation 2, 7, and here. It refers to glory divine. It harkens back, paradise, it harkens back to the garden sanctuary. Paradise lost is paradise regained in Christ, because of Christ and through Christ. Let me just summarize this amazing, glorious, good news proclamation by the suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second crossing of Christ upon the cross this way. For all of you, here is the promise of Christ to us that we remember, uh, that we treasure, that we reflect upon, uh, that we celebrate here this evening, this Good Friday, for all who truly place their faith in Christ alone, know this, salvation is now and forever. Amen. Salvation is now, today, and forever paradise, and it is guaranteed. It is most assuredly that we will experience the fullness of grace In paradise forever, for Jesus said, truly, I say to you. If he could say such a thing to one such as this, surely that grace can be and has been extended to us as well. This is the, the joy of salvation. This is the common bond that unites us. Uh, It is the love of Christ for us, and because he loved us first, we love him. But I realize that on this Good Friday that there are some here who, who resonate not with the, the softened convert, the new convert who cried out for grace upon the cross and was gloriously saved. Some of you relate more to the other criminal. Unbelieving listener, for a limited time, the door of salvation is open. Will you double down and perish in your sins like the hardened criminal? Will you continue to go on in your life mocking him? Scoffing him, wasting the heartbeat and breath that he grants you so graciously each and every day? Or will you cry out for mercy as the second robber did? Lord Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Thomas Watson said, it is not falling into water which drowns, but lying in it. It is not falling into sin which ultimately damns, but lying in it without repentance. Today, again, for many of you who've in previous gospel invitations Doubled down in unbelief. But the Lord is willing and able because of the perfect work of Christ upon Calvary's cross. Will you this day your Savior receive? If he would have you, 
would you not cast your sin before his cross and receive the priceless gift of eternal salvation? I pray you do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this Good Friday. We thank you for the Savior's suffering. We thank you for his sinless life, which is our robe of righteousness. We thank you for his perfect substitutionary death, that which, Father, is necessary for you to be both the just and the justifier of the one who places their faith in the Savior King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we pray, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest we forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead us to Calvary. Lest we forget Gethsemane. Lest we forget thine agony lest we forget thy great love for we. Dear Jesus, lead us to Calvary. This we pray in your great name and all God's people said, amen.